You're listening to Head Voice, bringing you inside the minds of the best in contemporary acapella. I'm Evan, and this week we had the pleasure of having Eric Scholes on the show. We both met at Boss. Eric was formerly in the award-winning Acapology at NC State and is now the owner, producer, and engineer of Eric Scholes Productions. You're currently listening to Utopia, the single that he produced for the Sons of Pitch's all-new original album, Don't Fret, which will be released this Friday, June 2nd, so be sure to check that out. Kayla and I are booking up our guests for the summer, so if you have any topics at all that you want us to tackle or guests you'd want to recommend, never hesitate to message us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And without any further ado, another episode of Head Voice. Hello, everybody. We are joined this week by Eric Scholes. Eric, would you mind giving us a little intro on how you got started in acapella? Sure, not at all. It's actually kind of funny how I got involved in acapella because I'd been I'd been doing music for so much longer before before I even thought I would be in an acapella group or that I would sing on a stage, period. But the way that I got started was I was walking around with my friend Michael on NC State's campus. We were freshmen um, in the fall semester, and we just saw some chalk on the brick pathway saying acapology auditions place and time and we're like do you want to sing an acapella group and both of us were kind of like yeah we probably won't get in but let's audition so we went we auditioned um and we miraculously both got in the group and uh it all just kind of like it just spiraled out of control from there so i I ended up uh i became co-music director of that group starting in my sophomore year and without really knowing too much about what i was doing i kind of like fumbled my way through and that group ended up being a lot of fun and not only a lot of fun um, ended up being kind of decent so i thought wow maybe like maybe something's going right here and eventually um i got kind of sucked into doing a lot of production stuff because that's just like where my background was since high school I'd been playing music and recording it for such a long time that it only made sense for me to bring it over into my new acapella interests. Um, and so I uh, I started working for a company called Liquid Fifth Productions. Um, I worked there full time for two years. And then in 2014, I decided to go solo and left that company and started Eric Scholl's Productions. And I've been doing that full time for the past three years. Been loving it. Cool. So at your company, Eric Schultz Productions, you do everything pretty much recording, mixing, mixing and mastering. So I just kind of wanted to start with the recording process and what that means for you. I know it means something different to everyone in the production industry. So what value do, do you see in the recording process and how do you approach it? I consider the recording process to be such a multifaceted endeavor because you have you have so many things at play like sure the main purpose of recording is typically to make it a, a single ep album whatever kind of release you're looking to make and to and to to connect with a listener in some way or to make a yearbook album whatever it is you're trying to do like the primary purpose is to is to make a record right but there's so much more that goes on in the recording process. There's there's a lot of learning. There's a lot of growth. There's a lot of maturing that happens in the recording process. And a lot of friendships are made. So honestly, I consider it like a whole package experience. And uh, I, I think it's just a total blast. And how would you suggest, since you've worked with so many different clients and so many different students, um, how would you suggest that people prepare for these sort of recording sessions? What's What are things that they should do leading up to the recording process? All right. Well, I think it's important to preface this by by saying that the the breadth of of groups that that I've recorded with is so wide that I've learned a lot about what different types of groups need to do to kind of be ready to come into the studio and have a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And if, if it's like a, if it's a student group or a group that where maybe there's a lot of part doubling, where you've got a few people on one part, it gets really easy to feel like, you know, your part and, and then come into the studio and be put on the spot and be on your own microphone and then realize, well, crap, like I don't, 
I, I don't know this passage, or I was way more confident before when I was singing with the rest of my, my, my part, but now like I'm getting stuck. And one thing that really helped my group when I was in it to rec- to uh, prepare for recording was we would we would do like quartets or quintets, how many however many parts there were in the arrangement, we would just select one person from each voice part and make them into a little mini group, and they would sing through all the parts of the song with the soloist. And you would, it would be immediately clear who didn't know their part at that point. And so that was a really easy way to get the whole learning process out of the way and then start to be able to focus on the things that really matter, like the emotional delivery and just the general, the general real, like the stuff that connects to the listener. Definitely. And when you're, when you have groups coming in, I think especially, you know, this applies maybe more on the scholastic side, but I'm sure some semi-professional groups do the same thing, but I know from experience, you know, you kind of, especially groups that have mostly been in a live setting and they're kind of recording for, you know, the first time or second time and don't have a lot of experience. There's, I think, generally a desire to have, you know, we just want to sound like us, right? And um, and I and Kale have both been watching this documentary called Sound Breaking, which is kind of about the history of, of recorded music. And, you know, you see people like... Um, uh, like a Brian Wilson or um, was it, or George Martin, you know, kind of taking full advantage of the studio. And they kind of, you know, were people in music history that realized that a live product is going to be different than a recorded product. What's your take on where recorded acapella should or can live versus, you know, the, the live scenario? Because I think that there's, you know, a big difference between those. Right. So, so kind of the difference between you know what works in a live situation and what works on a recording and also kind of um i i really i have a lot of respect for for people who who make recordings in a compelling fashion that also stays really true to what they can do in a live setting i think that that has a certain that has a certain really important power but it's so 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 difficult to pull off and i don't I don't consider it to be a go-to approach for me just because it's one of the hardest ways to make a compelling recording, right? Um, I would love to say that I listen to a lot of singer-songwriters who just record into one mic with an acoustic guitar because their songs are that good. But in reality, like, that's not what moves me. So while it varies a lot from client to client and from from artist to artist, I really try and, um, I I like to, I like to find the middle ground. And when a client wants to go completely bonkers and do something totally new in the studio, I'm also always game for that. I love though, focusing on just making a connection with, with my client beforehand and kind of getting on the same page, understanding what the point of this recording is and, and trying to trying to realize their goal and not mine. I'm there to make sure that it's moving, to make sure that it sounds awesome, and to make sure that that it's not going to totally alienate the people who are listening to it. But past that, like I really want if the group wants to sound like themselves, I want them to sound like themselves on the best day ever and then some, but not like somebody completely different. Right. And I think that's somewhat of a challenging thing to achieve because when you're standing behind a mic, at least when I'm standing behind a mic or recording something, I'm very much in my head. And I think most people are. They're just it's just a very different experience from singing with your group with 10 people surrounding you. So how do you kind of get the person or get the client out of their head when they're recording and get them to do a performance that's the most authentic to what they would do if their group was around them. That's the funniest thing, isn't it, though, right? Because, like, when you when you step into a studio for the first, second, or third time, and you step up to a microphone, and you open your mouth, what comes out is not what usually comes out in rehearsal. Mm-hmm. And it's not mm-hmm. what usually comes out in a performance. It's usually, like, a much more nervous version of you, a version of you that forgot to take a big breath before your take. And it just takes a little bit of time. My favorite thing 
is figuring out how to make every com- every client feel just a little bit more comfortable so that they can finally feel just secure in knowing that, oh, well, if I do a thing that's not really that good, it's not going to get on the recording anyways. Eric will cut this part out. He will delete the voice cracks. He will he'll get rid of the weird mouth noises. Like, I, I try and be as transparent as possible that there's really, there's nothing that's set in stone. I'm happy to go over things um, as many times as we need to within reason. And, um, and it really just depends on the person, uh, whatever makes them comfortable. Then I can start being a little bit more blunt and, and say, this, this seems like, hey, this is, this is the chorus of the song. You've got everybody on these big block ahs, and they're, they're kind of shouting, um, but you're not. Is, is this how you would normally perform this live? And, and most of the time, uh, the singer behind the microphone will say, oh, no, I didn't realize. I guess I'm being really quiet because we're in a really quiet room. And so sometimes it just takes a little reminder to, to, to say, like, you know, if you, if you want this to come across as fortissimo, like, it's got to be fortissitissimo in the studio. Um, it's got to be so much more. And I like to get a little bit weird and to joke around. And I think that, uh, I think that, that generally works. I, I find that um, I have a great time in the studio, and I think my clients have always expressed like really positive opinions on, on, on how they feel that the end product is and how the process was. So it's all about comfort. So acapella, as it currently stands, especially, you know, in the scholastic world and, you know, still semi-pro too, it is a, a form, art form kind of very reliant on cover music. And I think, as far as we know, you've had the opportunity to work on some original material with the Sons of Pitches most re- recently. So I guess I was just wondering when you're, you know, working on material uh, in this in that realm, how does your responsibility differ than if you were to do a cover song? Because at least from where I'm standing, if you're working on original music, you know, kind of you're making the song the song like it wouldn't exist if not for whatever buttons you're pressing so yeah exactly there's no there's no standard to compare it to right because this is just this is just original content it is pretty different it's um it is it's really eye-opening in a few ways um one thing that i experienced um probably the most is how invested the artist is when it's actually something that they wrote and sure, like there are exceptions to this because there are definitely cover songs that um, an artist will perform that really mean something special to them because like um, I know I know tons of songs that that say things in ways that are that are so much more well said than the way that I would put it. Um, and so when I feel like something is spoken for me or something just resonates with me um i suddenly get really invested in that but a lot of the time it's not my words and it's a little bit more difficult for me to be quite as invested whereas when the artist is actually the original artist they have some really specific ideas and um and for a lot of people putting out original music is it's nerve-wracking and there's a lot of second thoughts and there are just a lot of um There's a lot of experimentation that needs to happen because especially for the album that that the Sons of Pitches and I just did, it was it was such a like we had to shape these songs really in the studio that a lot of these tunes they hadn't performed live yet. Maybe I think a few of them have definitely been been in their live set, but a lot of this stuff just it hadn't been tested on the road. So we kind of had to play around with things and Um, and I have, I essentially kind of, I acted as a little bit of a quality control and I acted as kind of uh, a little bit of just like an outside perspective to just give those songs the final push that I thought they needed to really pop and to really, um, to really kind of just sound whole. Um, so I was, I was saying things like, um, 
if a phrase seemed a little bit clumsy to me, I would say like, hey, like, why don't we why don't we change the way this phrase is worded just a little bit um, just for the sake of aesthetics, just so it sounds a little bit better. And maybe we can meet, make it mean the same thing, um, but in a prettier way. Or if the song's not supposed to be pretty, you know, maybe we can get a little bit choppier in this section just to give like actually change the words to be choppier to give some rhythmic contrast in certain sections. And so you find yourself being able to play with textures and being able to shape the sound of a song by actually changing the content that's there in the first place. And I found that fascinating. I was also kind of... um, I was able to suggest uh, chords that I that I thought should be changed a little bit, entire sections that I was kind of like, okay, hold on, guys, give me an hour. I'm going to rearrange this section, and then um, and they they would come back, and I'd be like, all right, here's here's the new bridge. Do you guys like it? And and some of the guys, or like usually it would be like five of the six guys would be like, yeah, love it, and then like one of the guys would be like, I don't know. And we'd try it, and, and sometimes it would work. Sometimes it would be kind of like, I still don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the album's done. It's not out. There's one single out, and I think, I don't know, I think that there's a lot of really cool stuff on it. Uh, it's, it's always a huge learning experience. I think with that, I would imagine it would be somewhat challenging to kind of figure out what they want to get out of this album just because it's new material that you had never heard before and it's original so how did how did it work personally for you and how did you kind of what sort of time and effort did you have to put into this specific project to make sure that you fully understand what they were going for i'm really thankful to have a lot of most of my client relationships have been there for quite a long time. For instance, I've known the sons I've known since 2014. Oh wait, no, 2013 when I went out to England to record them for the first time. And a lot of my other clients like um like Duke Speak of the Devil, I've been working with them since 2013 or so. A lot of my clients um I've been with for such a long time that I I essentially get into a place, especially with the Suns, because they record so much that I'm kind of always talking to them. And when they have an idea, and when they're when they're just kind of thinking through whether they want to record this song or that song, or when they're thinking up this this next big project, I kind of get to hear about it a little bit early on before it's even ready to get to the stage of like you know me planning my travel and writing up a quote and kind of saying like oh what do you want to do with this? So I'm really I'm really happy that I get to know early on exactly what they're going for um so aside from the recording process you um you also do mixing and mastering so for someone like myself i know evan knows a ton more than i do but for someone like myself who doesn't know much about it could you just explain um the difference between mixing and mastering oh yeah totally uh basically mixing is taking all the separate sounds that you've recorded and combining them to create the sound of the song each song on an album is mixed separately and all the types of EQing, adding reverb, adding effects, changing the levels of individual voices, that all happens in mixing. When the mixes, all of the mixes for an album are finished and approved and the album's ready to go, then it can go to mastering and it only goes to the mastering engineer as a series of stereo files. So the mastering engineer doesn't necessarily have the freedom to just turn the kick drum up or the kick drum down or just turn the lead vocal down a little tiny bit. Of course, there are like some really cool tricks that mastering engineers have to to make it seem like you're pushing something forward or back, but it really is just a stereo file. And the more important lesson about mastering is that the mastering engineer is taking all the songs on an album and making sure that they fit within the context of one another and within the context of the album as a whole. Even if it's just a single, the mastering engineer is probably taking into account the way that other songs in its genre sound and making sure that it's kind of like that it fits and that um and that the vibe is right and that and that everything is going to sound good whether you're listening on a pair of Uh, cheaper earbuds or if you're listening in the car or if you're listening on your phone Mm -hmm. so you do a lot of uh both both of those things and (laughs) and i know that a a lot of um a lot of people in the industry 
tend to you know just do the mixing or just do the mastering part of it for the most part or like for one project we'll just choose to do you know or just the recording even so what are the challenges and advantages of you know taking a project from beginning to end there are some serious pros and cons to weigh in on when when you think about um, having specific people work on different parts of the process or having one person literally take a project from start to finish and i would even consider if i was to like consult with the client, then record, edit, and mix with them, I would still consider that taking a project all the way from start to finish. But it just happens that a lot of the projects that I do, um, I also do master. And usually when a client asks me, like, all right, like, should, should we master with you? Should we master with Dio? Should we master with Bill? I usually say, you know, it's, it's totally, there's advantages of, of going either way, right? Because one advantage of using an external mastering engineer, someone who's never heard the project before, is just that you get a new set of ears on it, right? You you get someone who's not catching all the things that you're used to hearing already and that you've tuned out all the little... Um, the little things that a first time listener might catch, but you've already, you know, gotten used to after listen after listen. So I think that's really important. And I, I think that's a huge, huge advan- advantage of using another mastering engineer. That's the that's like the traditional answer. That's that's why that's why we use mastering engineers. They're the final quality check. They they make sure it's great. Um, but at the same time, I also say, well, with a project that I've mixed and I'm also going to master, I get a little bit pickier when when I'm when I get into the mastering zone. And if there's something that when I'm starting to reference other music that I know sounds great and I'm starting to listen to a bunch of things and listening to it on different systems and stuff like that, if I suddenly catch something and it's easier for me to fix that in the mix, I'll go back into the mix session and I'll change it in the mix and then I'll master something that's way easier to master. Whereas, um, I know that as a mastering engineer, I've definitely asked the mix engineer for a new mix just because I think that one specific tweak will just make it so much better. But I think there's a way higher threshold for me to make that call. You know, it'll take a much more egregious um, error or oversight before before I ask the mix engineer, like, hey, I, I really think we need to get a new mix for this. Because you've worked with so many different clients and worked on so many different projects, you've probably come across material that covers a range of different genres and styles. So I'm just curious to see, do you have certain techniques or certain um, things that you do when you're working, when you're mixing or mastering a certain style? Totally. Yeah. Obviously, it starts with the source material and it it really starts with what's great about the recording in the first place Mm -hmm. and that really dictates what gets featured um and if it's if everything's amazing and um and it's in a a very distinctive style like say it's um say it's a rock tune and and you can tell um it was recorded live on a huge neve console and it's a little bit gritty and there's some like overdrive on the vocals and it's a little bit crunchier I like to push in that in that direction as long as the client's open to it. But if they really, you know, if the client's looking for a cleaner sound, I'm also happy to take a rock tune and push it into cleaner, slicker pop territory. I see a lot of, there's a lot of value in taking something that was one genre and through the acapella cover, kind of transforming it into another. I think that's really, really fun. But it just comes down to, it comes down to what you have in the recording usually um usually there's like a there there are a set amount of options well that's not true at all you can you can literally do anything but um (laughs) but there depending on on what you you have in the in the recording like you can you can figure out a couple ways to to twist it um if that's what the client's into so i think an element of that perhaps could be that um you'd mentioned that you know you you kind of came from a background of playing drums for a good part of your life and at least f- from my perspective you know the a big difference between different 
production companies or you know uh, producers in the acapella industry is how their drums sound at the end of the day so how how would you say that that influences how you mix or how you sample and all that stuff yeah i think i think that that makes a big difference from the start of the process um i even like to in the very beginning of the process kind of do a little bit of um depending on where the the vocal percussionist is I like to do just some suggestions or um, just kind of going through what they do in the song and um, and figuring out what's best and kind of bouncing off the arrangement and, and seeing what works. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is um, is figure out how to convey certain grooves to different vocal drummers. So I had a client in the studio a few weeks ago and I was trying to describe this groove and um, and it was something like... And, and I, like, this client just wasn't really learning audibly. It, it wasn't really coming across just by demonstration. So I thought, okay, like, I've got a pad of paper here. Um, maybe drum notation will work. You really only need, like, you don't need, even need a whole staff. You need, like, three lines, one for kick, one for snare, one for a hi-hat. And I literally just wrote out musically uh, what I was suggesting he try. And on the first try, he just read through it and nailed it. And that was really fun for me. And that was one way that I got to bring my drumming background into the recording studio because I had, like, I grew up playing drum notation. When I teach my uh, VP Like a Drummer class at festivals, I, I tell the whole class, like, hey, I think you guys should really build up your vocabulary. One of the best ways to do that is to grab a book that just has a bunch of different grooves in it and learn it. Um, one of my favorites is Rock and Bass Drum by uh, John Lombardi. It's just one that I used when I was really young, and it just got a lot of different grooves in it. And it's really easy to adapt to vocal drumming. Then when you get further down the road with editing, I try and be really sensitive to the feel that the drummer actually performed with and also the feel that we're aiming for and trying to figure out exactly how to make it just feel right, whether that's like just a tiny, tiny bit of swing, even if the song's straight, or if that means really going over the top with the accents and like maybe turning the hi-hat way down so the kick and snare really pop. Just kind of figuring out um, what the drums need to do for that song. I try to take as many different approaches as possible just to, to make the song unique and, and to not make my drums sound because they're not, they're not my drums. They're, they're someone else's drums. I don't want them to sound cookie cutter and I don't want them to sound too sampled. I, I love it when it still sounds punchy, but you can tell everything came from that vocal drummer's mouth. So kind of following that up, another thing that interests me is how a lot of acapella singers often don't really come from an instrumental background at all. And, you know, they're being expected to be the organ, the piano, the guitar, or whatever it is. So how do acapella groups make music that makes people move? If that's... Well, that's a great question. question. Okay, great. That, that's, yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. And that is a, a question that I've been trying to solve for years. Because what works for one group doesn't work for the next. And I think it comes down to taking advantage of what you have. So if you have, um, if you have a few basses who are great rhythmically, and you've got a vocal drummer who's great rhythmically, and you've got like a few more people scattered throughout the group who just have a natural talent for rhythm, it makes sense to take advantage of them and arrange the rhythmic parts for those people. And then the folks who kind of struggle with rhythm, who come from, not to say that a, a choral singer is, is like better at pitch than they are at rhythm, but, um, but I definitely think that using your strongest rhythmic people for the rhythmic stuff and then kind of putting everybody else on something that makes sense for them to sing, it just makes for a group dynamic that um, that flows and um, and there's a lot of other stuff in a big um, in a big dance or rock arrangement that doesn't require you to be like part of the rhythm section there's pads you know there are other melody lines that like sure they need to still fit within the pocket but um, but but they're not tasked with creating it all the time um, I definitely think it's it's great to start there and to use 
to your best advantage what you have and then and then from there just kind of figure out how to convey the pocket and the groove to everyone else in the group awesome that's uh a really great answer i think just to circle back one more time to kind of the recording process and everything sure that just occurred to me is like what from your vantage point as somebody who's you know been doing it for a while how much of a good studio recording is in the arrangement like how much can you can you doctor arrangement that's a little bit under or like how much is that the central focus of so much the arrangement in in a studio recording is gosh darn paramount it's so important in so many ways right because no matter how you look at a studio recording and no matter how you evaluate a studio recording the arrangement is going to be such an important factor because if you if you value a studio recording on like um, something even really surface level if you're like oh this sounds really good because it's really loud well the song can't be that loud if the arrangement has a lot of people singing in unison with one another or if if it has um, just a lot of stuff kind of conflicting with with other elements it makes it really hard for the mixing engineer to kind of make things discernible. Whereas with a really well thought out arrangement, um, you can you can kind of find a space for every individual element. And suddenly, not only does it sound fuller, but it starts to sound like you can actually hear, um, you can hear the important individual elements, um, but you can you can also kind of feel each part as a whole. Um, with a smart arrangement, I think that the whole package feels so much more moving and so much stronger while you also have the added advantage of just being able to hear what's going on and being able to appreciate all of the, all of the parts that make up that song. And it also, it can make or break the, the groove, the pocket. You can you can distract from the underlying rhythm or you can complement it. Uh, the arrangement is just, I would say that it's the most important thing right up next to the soloist because everything else, like you can, you can perform an incredible arrangement with a lot of singers who are just learning and put all of those singers in tune and in time. And you'll have a much greater product than, um, than a bunch of excellent singers kind of singing an arrangement that's that's a little bit garbagey oh, so, nice. sometimes <laughs> sometimes i mean <laughs> it, it always depends right like you know sometimes it's the the good singers are just going to sound good but um maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration but you know <laughs> Awesome. So I think we're nearing the end of our episode today. So one question that we like to ask all of our guests is what sort of trends do you see in acapella that you are a big fan of? Um, and what's next on the agenda for you specifically? Ooh, one of my favorite trends, and I don't even think it's that new anymore, but one of my favorite things was when, when Pentatonic started making music, uh, a lot of groups kind of embraced this s- more stripped down, more authentic, and more organic sound, right? To to appreciate that, yeah, it's just voices, and you can still make it sound big, but it doesn't have to sound exactly like the music that you're covering. That is my favorite thing. So the ingenuity that's came about uh, since the sing-off and since since there have just been more acapella groups in general is my favorite. And I, I love for, for people to kind of further explore what makes a voice sound like a voice and what makes a voice better at certain things than instruments are. And I think that's where acapella music should lie. I think it should really take advantage of what the voice can do and not worry about, you know, not worrying about be some, being something that it isn't. We're snapping. <laughs> I'm really happy with with the way that um the way that my client relationships are going and I'm really happy with the all of the music that I'm working on right now. Honestly, I'm I'm just really thrilled about the projects I have in progress right now. But one big thing for me this summer is that I want to get back into my own studio recording projects 
the last time I released a song was in 2014. It's been three years already since uh, the two singles I released uh, with a few friends. So I'm going to get back into doing some more arranging this summer uh, as long as I as long as I can make the time. I'm really excited to to get singing a little bit more. Sweet. Well, we're definitely looking forward to it. We were listening to Isabella of Castillo uh, before, before, and it was really awesome. So yeah, well, cool. we're looking forward to that. Um, thank you, Eric, for joining us this week. Thanks for um, having me. And we hope that you will join us next week for a new episode of Head Voice. Woo! Well, no one told me that I could feel as lonely as I do tonight. I'll swallow my pride and find my way without a told me that I could be as desperate as I am tonight. All fears aside, I'll find my way without a home. I'm wasting my time hiding to try and be free. Creating a little utopia, but the only one here is me.